How much does character really matter in the life of a public leader? The fact is that a leader's life impacts more than himself, and I think we all know that to be true. Perhaps you've become familiar with the name George Santos. Quoting Dr. Moeller, Albert Moeller's recent commentary about him, We have a very interesting story of George Anthony DeVolder Santos, or Anthony Zabrowski, or Anthony DeVolder. Who actually knows who he is? The bottom line is that voters in a congressional district in the state of New York elected George Santos to the United States House of Representatives. Back in September, a newspaper on Long Island known as the North Shore Leader had published an investigative report and also made an editorial statement in which it basically said that there's no proof that anything this man said about himself is true. That referred to the facts of his birth, the background to his life, the schools both in high school and in college that he had supposedly attended, and from which he had graduated with distinction, of course, and the jobs that he had supposedly held in finance and the fortune he had supposedly earned. His Jewish background is not true. He said he was Jewish, not Jewish, when he tried to make some explanation. He claimed a family fortune, but there appears to be no fortune in his family. And furthermore, he's now being investigated for the criminal abuse of campaign funds because he he tended to have turned in expenses, including something like $40,000 worth of airline tickets. But guess what? They are on Long Island. You don't need a jet to get from one end of the island to the other. But it also turns out that an awful lot of his expenses ended up just one penny short of the reporting threshold. He said he was something of a wonder child working at Citigroup and Goldman Sachs, but both of the companies say they've never heard of him. Now, don't answer this too quickly, but does character actually matter in the life of a public leader? Wouldn't his political philosophy, his charismatic demeanor, his social influence be sufficient for him to be an effective leader as a representative in Congress? Because after all, as we've been told over the last number of years, when we're electing a political leader, it's not like we're electing a pastor. Is Mr. Santos qualified? to be a representative in the United States Congress? And if we say no because of his personal character, then the electorate across this country need to begin recalling more than just him. How important is a man's personal character when considering him for leadership, even church leadership, especially for us, church leadership? I mean, after all, are the qualities that we want in church leadership more about personality, presentation, style, organizational effectiveness? Well, if you say no, it's got to be more than that, then what are the qualifications to be a pastor? And where are you going to get those qualifications? Who gets to decide what those qualifications are? As you just heard read, a kind of life A kind of character is the actual focus of the Apostle Paul when he describes the kind of man that should be put into leadership, especially as Paul and Titus are finishing the work of establishing churches on the island of Crete. What kind of people will they put in leadership? It seems to me that the Apostle Paul thinks that character is the only thing that really matters. It's not the ability to just simply be a charismatic, popular person in a pulpit. There has to be a kind of life outside of the public, or otherwise the man should not serve as a leader in the church. 
Now, if the book of Titus is all about what it means to be a gospel-centered church, and we tried to unpack that and unfold it a few weeks ago to say it is. This book is all about what it means to be a gospel-centered church. And if so, where do we begin in describing what a gospel-centered church looks like? If you're looking for a church and you're saying, I want one that is gospel-centered, where do you start to look? According to Paul, you begin with the leaders, the leadership, because they set the course for the character of the rest of the congregation. And whatever bent you find emphasized in the leaders' lives, you will eventually find as the emphasis of the entire church. What leaders model, members will eventually reflect. Titus 1 is all about choosing the right men to lead a church so that it reflects the centrality of the gospel. These verses we're looking at from verse 5 down to verse 16 describe the arenas of a man's life that a congregation or even the public even outside the church. Here are the arenas of a man's life that we should evaluate to know if he's actually gospel-centered or not. So what are these arenas in which a congregation should investigate as to whether a man is a gospel-centered kind of leader? Well, we began looking at that last week. There are four arenas of life that we need to consider. The first we looked at last week in verse 5, and we said an elder is gospel-centered in his calling, in his calling. You remember that we focused on what Paul and the New Testament meant by the word elder. For this reason, I left you in Crete, Paul says in verse 5, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. This is a word that is used in the book of Acts and throughout the epistles of the New Testament to describe a church leader. Local church elders are called to be men who are examples to the church, who oversee the church, and who shepherd the church. That's what's found in that idea of elder. And it is of necessity that a congregation would call elders to serve Otherwise, that church risks being out of order, creating disorder. In fact, a congregation should strive to call out a plurality of men to serve as elders. And those men should be those of whom the congregation desires and wants to follow because of their gospel-centeredness. Their calling is the first arena. Are these men called to lead as the Bible calls them to lead? The second arena that we should examine is where we pick up this morning the second arena of a man's life that shows him to be a gospel-centered leader. Number two, an elder is gospel-centered in his family. In his family. Namely, verse six, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. When you are looking to see if a man has the marks of scriptural gospel-centered calling and character, you not only look at his abilities personally, you look at his family chiefly. Similar to what 1 Timothy 3, 5 says in the parallel passage in 1 Timothy If someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? If you can see a man practically applying the gospel in his family, when he calls you to do the same, you're likely going to listen to him. I have a wonderful family, love my kids, love my wife, but there are times it's difficult, right? And all my family said, amen. There are times it's difficult, parenting's difficult, husband-wife relationship can be difficult, and there have been times when someone has expressed to me, you know, how can I be praying for you? And I'll say, hey, you know, we're, we're going through a challenging season right now, and, and, and I get these interesting comments like, oh, I'm so glad it's hard for you. <laughs> and I, I don't quite know how to take that at times, other than I think I understand It's not any different for us as it is for anyone else. 
And what, you, what you're trying to do is always bring the gospel to bear in the life of your family. And it's challenging at times. Sin is challenging. People are, are difficult. The pastor's not always on the, on the right side of things all of the time. His attitude needs adjustment at times. But we're not talking about the perfection of life here. We're talking about the overall direction. Now, there are two areas of an elder's home. There's two elders of an elder's family that are to be gospel-centered. First, an elder cultivates gospel-centered devotion to his wife. He cultivates a gospel-centered devotion to his wife. So when you start asking the question and you start looking at the comments here, who should you appoint as an elder? When Titus is to go throughout all of these congregations that are being started on the island of Crete and he begins to look, what does he look for first? Well, Paul tells him you need to find someone who is above reproach. Well, what does that word mean? What does above reproach mean? Well, it refers to a lifestyle where a legitimate and obvious accusation cannot be made of consistent sin or a lack of clear gospel-centered devotion. We're not talking about absolute perfection or no one would ever serve as an elder. And think about it. Remember, on this island of Crete, everyone on this island was a new Christian. At least... Most of the people there were new Christians. There weren't any churches. They're all being established for the first time. So you're not talking about perfection here. But you are looking, is there an obvious, intentional, gospel-centeredness to his life in which no accusation could be hurled at him because it consistently sticks as a mark of his character. He's above reproach. But how do you know what to look for in determining what above reproach means and what it looks like? Where do you go practically? Well, you first start to look at his marriage. His marriage. The Bible says here in verse 6, he is to be the husband of one wife. Literally, in the Greek text, it's read a one-woman man. Now, some people suggest that this is a reference to polygamy. I don't have any problem with that. You can't be a one-woman man if you're married to lots of women. So I don't have any problem with that. It probably means that. But it doesn't only mean that. Well, some suggest that a one-woman man means that a man has never been divorced. He's only had one wife. That could be true. If you have a man who can't stay married, you'd probably want to know why. But there's more to this phrase than just merely a prohibition on polygamy or divorce. The phrase in its basic form describes a man who is marked by being devoted to one woman. It's an issue of a kind of loyalty, a devotion, an affection that is reserved for only one woman. In the first century, it would have been common to find men married to multiple women. It would have been very common. Divorce was rampant in the first century for virtually any reason a man could think of. He could divorce his wife and throw her away. So if a man was divorced in such a way that he had a reputation of being disloyal to his wife, you obviously would say that's not a one-woman kind of man. Why? Because the reputation of disloyalty indicates that he's not one who had been applying the gospel to marriage. Not when you understand what the gospel says about marriage. Well, some are going to ask, well, does this imply that if a man was divorced before his conversion, he shouldn't serve as an elder? And I've heard some say, no, any sin that anyone has committed before they've come to Christ is off the table. You don't examine that. But wait a minute. What if that affects his testimony in the community? Even his pre-conversion life continues to affect his testimony in the community. And even examining his present attitude to a pre-conversion divorce, what is his attitude toward it? 
Is he humbled by it? Has he pursued reconciliation according to the scripture where it was biblically faithful to do so? Was he repentant of the behavior that cultivated the previous divorce, that of which he was responsible? You'd want to know that because it speaks to not just merely was he married before, but is he a one woman kind of man? It's his character. Not just his marital status, it's his character. We all understand. A man could be married to one woman, one woman for all of his adult life and still not be a one woman kind of man. Men, if you are constantly, if you're married and you are constantly engaged in looking at and entertaining pornography, you are not a one woman kind of man, even if you never get divorced. It doesn't show a loyalty in your heart and a devotion fixed on the gospel to one woman. If your vocation means more to you than your family and your wife and your marriage and you would risk the marriage... It's hard to say you're a one-woman kind of man, even if you never got divorced. So this qualification has to go beyond whether a man stays married because of the way the Bible describes marriage. Marriage is a picture of the love that Christ has for the church. So what you're looking for, is there that kind of gospel devotion in a man toward his wife? Such as you find in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a gospel-centered devotion. He gave himself up, Christ did for the church, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Is that the kind of characteristic that you see in a man's life toward his wife because that reflects the heart of Christ for his church, which is what marriage is to picture. So let's not get too bent out of shape over all the semantics of marital status. Let's look at what kind of a man is he in relationship to his wife. If a man isn't going to apply the gospel in the closest relationship in life that he has, How effectively will he apply it in the life of the church, especially some of the more difficult moments? An elder has to be someone who exemplifies a gospel-centeredness in his devotion to his wife. But not only that, secondly, an elder cultivates a gospel-centered respect among his children. A gospel-centered respect among his children. He tries to cultivate a gospel-centered respect among his children. It's found in the next phrase in verse 6. He's not only the husband of one wife, but he is also the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. So, if our marriages are supposed to be the first barometer of how deep the gospel is driving our lives, our children are the next. This opening phrase here is a difficult, difficult one, children who believe, but it is a telling one. The difficulty in this phrase, children who believe, is asking and answering the question, does this mean that an elder's children have to be Christians? Must they all be Christians? Are they children who are marked by faith? Now, it could be, literally, this this word translated not just children who believe, but it could be translated faithfully as children who are trustworthy or children who are faithful. But here's the challenge in trying to determine where you land on that. The word faith or believe that's used here, pistos in the Greek New Testament, is almost always used in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus in terms of some kind of trustworthiness or faithfulness in relationship to the gospel message. So it's some kind of faithfulness in relationship to the gospel. 
So it's not merely, do you have children who are responsive to their father's discipline? Discipline can be found in homes that don't have the gospel. And discipline doesn't necessarily indicate that you would be a good steward of God's people if you're just merely an effective authoritarian. There's more to it. And something else here, the fact is that the text indicates that these fathers are those who are having children. So it seems to indicate that these children are in the home. They're under the father's direct authority. These aren't children who have left the home and are living somewhere else or adult children who have moved away. It's those who are in the home. And it could be that a child could show a positive respect for his or her father's faith because of a gospel-driven character and leadership And those children could still remain unbelieving in the home. Once out of the home, and they're on their own, they go their own way, not necessarily showing that the father was an ineffective gospel leader, but in spite of the fact of his gospel leadership. It could be. But you look at, while under his care, do they show themselves faithful to what his gospel-driven leadership looks like in seeking to apply the word of God to the hearts of his children. How do you know this? How would you know this? What do you look for in children to see if they're faithful to his gospel-centered leadership? Well, Paul tells us they're not accused of what? Dissipation. That's a word you use all the time, isn't it? No. No. Or rebellion. So what what is dissipation? Well, dissipation is something directly linked. It's a lifestyle directly linked to being godless. There's no relationship of God to your life. Ephesians 5.18 connects drunkenness to the sin of dissipation. Sexually immoral lifestyles of the unbelieving world are reflected as dissipation. Or they're rebellious. That refers to outright animosity toward authority, a life characterized by intentional pursuits of life contrary, a life contrary to the scripture. They're outright rebellious while under a man's leadership. This is a call to consider how a father is fathering with the gospel. And you want to be careful. As parents who have raised their children know, there is no silver bullet book you can read. There is no method you can apply that guarantees your children will walk with Jesus, right? There isn't one. You can say, well, I found one that I think gets at least pretty close. If you have, I wonder if you really understand the gospel. Because God alone through the work of the word and what he describes in the message of the gospels, the only thing that unlocks a child's heart, not our methodologies, not our consistency, thank God. It's him and his word alone. I mean, we just heard someone baptized who lives in a good home where the gospel is there and it's clear And he's even going to memorize the Bible, but doesn't really want to, right? In his heart, he's saying, I don't want to do this. And he does it again, and he's still not believing. And again, and memorizes whole books and still not believing until the word does the work, right? That was a great testimony to that. However, on the flip side, if you have a father or a family who is not intentional at all in applying the gospel, not intentional in any way in seeking to establish in his children God's word and an understanding of the truth and praying and begging God and pleading and working and confronting when necessary and persevering as it's always necessary in parenting. If he's not doing that, he shouldn't be an elder because he's not showing gospel-centered leadership in his home. And it will show as sin is unchecked in a home, it will flourish As 1 Timothy 3, 4 says, he must be one who manages his own household well, 
keeping his children under control with all dignity. That's really the heart of the matter. It's not, not whether or not does, do the children believe. Other, otherwise, you're not really going to have any elders until they're all the children are essentially out of the home and prove themselves to be believers. That doesn't seem to be the indication of this text. In fact, uh, I, I just a quick note here. I don't think that what verse 6 is saying is that every elder has to be married or that every elder has to have children. It's if a man is married, you look at his marriage. And if he has children, you look into his home. Where, that's the fundamental first ground of where you look to see if a man is being driven and centered in the gospel. We have no indication that Timothy, Titus, or Paul, or many of Paul's traveling preachers were married, or if they had children, but they weren't disqualified to serve. So this must be more, more than, well, he's married and he has kids, and they do what he tells them. It's more than that. In fact, I think we all inherently know that. We know that. You're willing to walk with a man if you see him leading his home. Where you see him negligent in leading his home, you start to question whether or not this is an example you want to follow. And well, you should. That's convicting to me. And it's, and it's a little difficult. I was raised in a pastor's home, so I read this and I think, oh, the whole church is just going to be examining me as a pastor's kid all the time. You know what the reality is? Yes, that happens. And you can say, oh, no, we would never hold your children to a different standard. Yes, you do. I mean, not, not because you're, you're mean and hateful. No. You tend to look at it because that's a place you begin to examine to see is the gospel being played out in a home. That's good. It, it's challenging for our children. It's challenging for any child to, to come under that kind of eye of scrutiny at times or to have that sense in which you think, well, I've got to be perfect or my dad's job is on the line or I've got to be perfect because everybody thinks I'm a pastor's kid. It is challenging. We want to cultivate a kind of atmosphere around here that's simply looking for faithfulness in the gospel. We want that. We want to come alongside our elders and their families and encourage them in the work of the Lord, not discourage them. But that doesn't change the fact. The home is where you look first. Is there an intentional leadership in the home in a man's devotion to his wife and in the lives of his children? Do you see the gospel message at work? That's the first arena that we're looking at here. The calling first. Secondly, marriage and family. Third, the third arena of a man's life that shows him to be a gospel-centered leader. Well, you thought, man, if, if, is that not enough? No, here's the third one. An elder is gospel-centered personally. Personally. Verse 7, for the overseer, just another term as we looked at last week, the overseer, the elder, the pastor, they're all the same, must be above reproach. There's the same word, no accusation, legitimate accusation, of a gospelless leadership could stick. He's above reproach. And he is above reproach as God's steward. That is one who sees himself as responsible to God. Is there a sense in which he looks at his life and his leadership as he's directly responsible to God, especially in his personal life? And he goes on and lists a laundry list of details of what you look at to see if a man in his personal life is gospel-centered. There's two categories we should look at. One is negative, one is positive. So you first look at the negative side. He's gospel-centered in the sins he avoids. In the sins he avoids. Do you see it in verse 7? He's not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. Let me touch on these. First, he avoids arrogance. That's in the word self-willed. He avoids arrogance. It's used two times in the New Testament. As one commentator described it, this is a person who, quote, holds other people cheap. This is the self-satisfied man who's always pleased with himself to the belittling of other people around him. Now, self-willed is more than just being aloof. 
It can be that, but it's more than just being aloof. It refers to a person who seems to regularly exalt himself. Maybe he's friendly, but he's always friendly so that you're impressed with him. He's always quick, not just to defend himself, but to express himself. That's self-willed. It's, it's contrary to the humbling work of the gospel. The gospel reminds us that apart from Christ, our good deeds are filthy. In Christ, our deeds are glorious because they show the glory of Christ. They never show our glory. Self-willed. An arrogant man who always has to have his way. Also, he avoids quick temper. He avoids a quick temper. He's not quick tempered. This is the only time in the New Testament we find this word. It refers to a man who is easily inclined towards anger and he regularly expresses it. Anger is an easy expression of personal pride, isn't it? Why, why do we become sinfully angry? Just stop for a moment. Why, why do you become sinfully angry most often? Because what we wanted, what we expected, what we believe should have happened, didn't happen. And we get upset and we get angry because we thought our way was going to be the better way and you didn't do my way. And I get angry. But when you're a believer who hears the message of the crucified Son of God, and that message is guarding your heart, what angers us should not be that we didn't get our way. What angers us should be what has transgressed against the righteousness of God himself, not us. We can't elevate ourselves to the standard because that displaces God as the standard. That's pride. If a man is easily angered, he's probably easily distracted from being Christ-centered, isn't he? Also, notice he avoids drunkenness. He's not addicted to wine. He avoids drunkenness. Drunkenness is another sign of self-indulgence. The phrase here describes someone who is characteristically controlled by, regularly conquered by, intoxicating drink. We're not talking about the man who has had a drink. We're talking about a man who regularly gives himself over to the controlling effect of alcohol. Perhaps if the drug culture were as it were in our world, he'd slip that one in there too. We have to be careful with this. Some kind of genetic predisposition doesn't make you a drunk. Drunkenness flows from a mindset that lacks gospel-centeredness, that moves the will, and it moves the will when it's not centered on the gospel towards self-indulgence. That's not the mark of a man you want leading the church. When the satisfaction that comes from the drink becomes more compelling than joy in Christ, it's a clear sign of a lack of being gospel-centered. In Scripture, drunkenness is often associated with the unbelieving world. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Ephesians 5, 18, it's a mark of the unbelieving world. So drunkenness, you, you look at that, is this the character of his life that he's constantly given over to being stimulated by alcohol? Because Jesus somehow isn't enough? It's another sin he avoids. He avoids violence. He avoids violence. That's the word pugnacious. Not an, again, that's a Bible word. It's not one you use in common conversation. Pugnacious. This is a man who is characteristically violent in how he handles adversity. He carries himself with this air of don't cross me, don't mess with me. Pugnacious is a little different than being quick-tempered, though they could be seen together. Quick-tempered might just express itself in some kind of verbal aggressiveness, but pugnacious is something physically violent. He doesn't settle his differences here. The text is saying he doesn't settle his differences through some kind of physical intimidation. You say, I can't even imagine that. I, I can I remember being invited outside after a sermon once by another church leader to settle what he thought was a difference of interpretation of the Bible. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way to do it. I looked at the guy and I said, I'd clearly lose. There's got to be another way through this, right? By the way, that was in Texas. Maybe that's a cultural thing. I don't know. (laughs) 
Why would a penchant towards violence be a display of not being gospel-centered? Because a gospel-centered life looks at other lives as being created in the image of God. And he's driven by that. So he would never harm, intentionally harm to settle a difference, someone who's created in the image of God. That means more to him. He avoids violence. A fifth sin an elder avoids, he avoids longing for sinful gain. He avoids longing for sinful gain. It's found in the phrase, not fond of sordid gain. This is all one word in the Greek. It's found also in the qualifications for deacons in 1 Timothy 3 8. It's a man who always craves more for himself, not just in material wealth, but certainly that could be an arena of that, but not just in material worth, wealth, but any kind of personal gain, prestige, attraction, recognition. And he's willing to manipulate the congregation and the circumstances to achieve more for himself. He is willing to sin so he can have more. That's sordid gain. It's contrary to Christianity because it's the quest for self-glory. And that robs God of what uniquely belongs to him. God is the one who is to be glorified. Not a pastor, not a personality. If you find a man who constantly craves the attention and attraction and the gain that he can have as a leader, he is not driven by the gospel. The gospel humbles us. It humbles us. Some would say, ah, well, this means here, since they can't be men who are fond of sordid gain, we probably shouldn't pay them anything. I don't think it's an indication that those who serve as elders can't be remunerated. The Bible says otherwise in places like 1 Corinthians 9 or 1 1 Timothy 5. But it could be that when you do remunerate a man, he's never content with what you give him. He's not content. He's he's ministering for the money. You want to look, is he financially controlled? Because that might show whether or not he's content with God's provision or not. That would show, does his heart pursue the glory of God? Or does it demonstrate some kind of penchant for having more for himself? Now, I just want to say this as we kind of wrap up these, these vices that he avoids In all of these vices, all of these sins that an elder avoids, did you notice that they are all sins that make more of the man and less of God? That's what you're looking for in the character. Is he constantly drawing to himself or is he constantly pushing us toward, look at the glory of God, not me. Look at the word of God, not listen to me. Now that's the negative side. Those are the sins of gospel-centered eldership that they avoid. What's the positive side? Well, secondly, he's a gospel-centered man in the virtues that he cultivates. In the virtues that he cultivates. It begins in verse 8. And similarly to what we said with the sins that an elder avoids, these are virtues that are characteristic of a man's life. It's not that a man never fails in these areas, but they don't mark him. They don't characterize him. The first one that he cultivates, his home is open. His home is open. That's the word hospitality. He's hospitable. Meaning he is one whose home, his family, his personal life is not restricted from others, but it's open to them. An elder is not one who is marked by being exclusive and private, but open and involved in the lives of others. An elder sees his home as a place for service. It's a place for encouragement. It's a place for discipleship. His home is a place for gospel fellowship. It's a place to involve people, not keep people out. This is where the gospel becomes personal. It's where the gospel becomes welcoming. It's not just his office door that is open, so is his front door. Hospitality is not one of those qualifications you just say, okay, does his wife have it? No, this is of an elder. 
This is of an elder. When I was in seminary, I lived in a house full of seminary guys. And one of the things, this was not true of all seminary houses. We lived across the street from the school and the church where it was housed. And in this particular house, we just made sure that five nights out of the week, we had a, a decent meal. And that meal had standards, which was good for seminary students. It had standards, like you had to have some kind of meat and a salad and a vegetable. And the, I mean, you had to think it through. And one of the reasons we did that, and we, we had it together every night, five nights a week, and, and we could invite anybody over. So if it's your night to cook, you just needed to know, was, were, were they inviting people over to your house? And why do we do that? I was kind of curious when I heard about this, and I'm like, why are you guys doing that? I'm like, well, we need to learn how to cultivate the issue of hospitality among ourselves. And it was wonderful. Virtually all those guys were in my, my wedding as, as uh, men who stood up with me at the wedding became such good friends. We, we saw guys get married and it was kind of the testing ground for when I was dating Kelly. She had to come over. I had to fix dinner for everybody and she had to go through the gauntlet of the other men in our house. See if she could handle give what, they give at, what they would give out and she gave out as much as they did. And... Uh, at the end of it, they said, all right, I think you can go ahead and you can move forward and marry her. And I said, oh, I'm glad, glad I've got your approval. It's just, a, it's just a, a way to try to cultivate hospitality. Do you do that? If, if you're not good at it, do you cultivate it? Do you challenge the things that keep you from it and cultivate hospitality? Leadership is not for the reclusive. He loves what is good. That's another quality and virtue he develops and cultivates. He loves what is good. He is loving what is good. Those things that are marked as good in the scripture are the sorts of things that find place in the elder's heart and in his affection. Justice, mercy, kindness, righteousness, holiness. Those are good in the eyes of God and he loves those things. His joy is found in those kinds of things. He's not the Pharisee who tithes and still hates He's not the religious leader who studies but doesn't care. He not only loves truth, but he's kind and he's patient in the application of truth to the hearts of others. The gospel breeds a love for what God sees as good. Next, he is self-controlled. He's self-controlled. It's found in the word sensible. That word sensible means he possesses an air of vigilance over his thinking. He's intentional in his responses and his activities so that he's seen as one who makes sensible choices. He's not known for a loose tongue or as one who speaks before he considers. His actions are measured, they're calm, they're controlled, they're thoughtful. He shows the control of the Holy Spirit in how he thinks and in what he says and in how he acts and the ways he responds. That's sensible. He's just, that's the next one, he's just, that's a life marked by what God says is correct and good and what God finds acceptable. He's just. He's devout, that's the next one, he is devout. That is, he's a man who is obviously marked by worship and devotion to God. When you encounter him, you see, you feel, you sense, you're left with a devotedness to the purposes of God and his word. He's also disciplined. That is the word self-controlled found in this text. It's an interesting term. It's only used here in the New Testament. And it suggests that a man's life is one characterized by purposefulness. He is purposeful. He has goals and they're driven by gospel-centeredness. He makes plans and they're governed by Scripture. He has a trust in the sovereignty of God. He has an intentionality about his life that is focused on the supremacy of God that will result in benefiting other people. He's disciplined. He focuses his life to live for the gospel. That's the kind of personal life that when you examine it and you look at it, it leaves you thinking more about God and God's purposes and God's designs than merely the man you just encountered. So in the sins that he avoids, they're all about self-exaltation. But in the virtues that he cultivates, they're all about God-exaltation. Did you see that? 
Do you see in him a radical self-centeredness or a radical God-centeredness? That's what you're looking for. And by the way, it's hard to know that unless he's involved with you, unless he's in the church with you. His calling, his family life, and his personal life all display a life that is driven by the scriptures and the gospel that is contained in them. Let's look at a final mark. Final arena that says if a man is gospel-centered. Fourth, an elder is gospel-centered doctrinally. In his family, he's gospel-centered. Personally, he's gospel-centered. But he's also gospel-centered doctrinally. That's verses 9 through 16. So what you're looking for, and you look at a man, you say, well, the character is correct. What you then want to see is, is the character correct because it flows from convictions founded on the Scripture. It comes from Scripture itself, the Word of God. He's doctrinally faithful. So while an elder is a godly man and a great guy to be around, he must also be a man who is theologically sharp and committed to the application of doctrine to the life of the entire church. His life is lived well because his convictions and his beliefs are compelling and they're vigorous. But a man's doctrinal life is not merely seen in how he answers theological questions, but in how he applies theological convictions. There's four different qualities about an elder's doctrinal life that we want to look at. We'll do it quickly. Four different qualities about an elder's doctrinal life to examine. First, he's doctrinally gospel-centered in his devotion. In his devotion. I find that in the phrase that you, you see in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching. Here's what I want you to see from this phrase. Doctrinal devotion, he holds fast the faithful word. Doctrinal devotion. It's actually linked as a mark of how the qualities that are mentioned in verses 7 and 8 are kept. He is this kind of man described in verses 7 and 8 because he is always holding fast the faithful word. Why does he have this kind of personal character? Because he's holding himself to the word of God, the faithful word. It flows from the word. It's not just something he's trying to do to get a job. He loves the word and he wants his life to be impacted by the scriptures. That's the idea behind this. A qualified elder will not dismiss all of those, vir- those virtues and all of those vices. He won't describe all of, those, all of those virtues and say, well, it's just not me. It's not the way I was raised. It's not my personality. No, an elder doesn't say that. An elder says, here's the word. Here's what it should do in character. And I got to pursue that. I got to cultivate that in me. So that the theology that he studies is the theology that he lives The theology he lives flows from the theology he believes with conviction. This phrase is also given in what the Greek, original Greek describes as the middle voice, meaning he's doing it to himself. He's intentionally holding himself firm in the word that has been faithfully taught. This also assumes that he's already showing these qualities because he's already holding firm the faithful word. In other words, a seminary degree does not make you qualified. Do you show the qualities of a biblical life? Secondly, when we're looking at an elder's doctrinal life, we find, secondly, he is doctrinally gospel-centered in his instruction. In his instruction. He's holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that, notice this, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine. Just stop there. To exhort in sound doctrine. He's doctrinally gospel-centered in his instruction. Meaning his devotion to the word is one that drives his character and creates an ability, even a compulsion and a confidence to exhort others to adhere to the same faith. 
The word exhort sometimes is translated as encourage. But in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, this word exhort most often has a sense of urgency behind it. It's a call for urging, urge, exhort, not just encourage. Sound doctrine then by the elder is urged on the consciences of his flock. When he commands, it is the scripture he commands, not personal opinion. When he urges someone to stop a behavior, it flows from what he finds to be more healthy because it comes from the Bible. Sound doctrine drives his urging. He's not urging you to simply do what he says. He's urging you to see your life in front of God. Third, an elder is doctrinally gospel-centered in his confrontation. This is the hard one for us, his confrontation. He exhorts, and notice at the end of verse 9, he is to refute those who contradict. He's to refute. Now, before I get into this issue about confrontation, can I just say this? I'm, I'm always concerned, and you should always be concerned with a person who loves confrontation. Right? You, sh- you should worry about people who love to go confront. I just want to go put the word right in front of them. I love to confront. You find someone like that, Run. Don't, don't affirm him as an elder. That's not a good sign. But avoiding confrontation should equally be concerning. Confrontation of sin is an obvious, constant, negative, oftentimes painful part of pastoral ministry. We all know that. And, and we could probably all think of instances where confrontation was necessary and it was never pursued and we watched the negative painful effects emerge and the spread of that pain into the lives of others because no one would confront. If sin or unhealthy or false teaching is never corrected, it's going to make the offender emboldened to offend further as well as drive the false teacher further from the truth that could actually transform him if he was confronted by it. What does unchecked false instruction do to a church when it's never confronted? It discourages people, leads them astray. An elder who will never say no, who will never challenge, never correct, and eventually he, he simply will not stand up to error in the church, he's going to erode trust among the flock. We often think the opposite. We often think if I confront, they're going to leave. They might. But who would stay? If you do confront, some might leave. But who would actually stay? Those who respond to the truth. Who would stay if you never confront? Those who don't want to give themselves to the truth. So Paul says, refute those who contradict, expose the error, bring it to light, bring scriptural conviction against the error. Notice verse 10, because you have to do this, because there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. It appears that in the island of Crete, there was a particular false teaching that was arising from some kind of Jewish source. That's why he mentions the circumcision, a mark of the Jewish population. More than likely, it was some kind of false teaching that was urging the use of the Old Testament law as a means of making someone acceptable before God. It's a misuse of the Old Testament, urging them to avoid certain things or pursue certain things based on the Old Covenant. We gain that because, in verse 14, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men is mentioned. Verse 16, they profess to know God, meaning they they say they know the God of the Bible. In chapter 3, verse 9, it talks about foolish controversies and genealogies and disputes about the law, meaning the Old Testament law. So there's some kind of Jewish false teaching going on here. But did you notice the personal characteristics of those who require a rebuke? They're rebellious because they recognize recognize no authority above themselves. They're empty talkers. 
They teach with authority, but not scriptural authority. So what they have and they say authoritatively isn't grounded in an understanding of the Bible that's accurate. They're deceivers because they intentionally exclude scriptural detail. They hedge on what they actually know because they want to promote their pet doctrine. They talk more than they listen. They say less than what is accurate and they rebel more than they submit. What do you do with them? Verse 11, they must be what? Silenced. They must be silenced. Similar to what you'll find in chapter 3, verse 10, reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. You have to silence them. This is one of the, the jobs of an elder. He's to protect the flock. You have to silence them because they're upsetting whole families. They're teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. It gains them a following. It's not according to the scripture and it's upsetting entire family groups. Can you imagine? Yes, you can. Because you've probably seen something like that. Little fringe pet ideas that are not central to the gospel. They use Bible verses to try to bolster them but they're not critical to your spiritual life and whole groups of people gang on board with those things those people need to not be followed they should be silenced you say well, that sounds harsh no it's keeping people away from life-giving truth you can't let them keep talking about it when it steals actual spiritual life Notice verse 12, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And this could be a reference to the false teachers. That these Cretan false teachers, they're liars. They're not speaking the truth. They're evil beasts. They only have their own self-interest in mind. And they're lazy. They will not give themselves over to the same level of standard they're trying to apply to other people. They're lazy. Paul acknowledges it. This testimony is true, verse 13. For this reason, reprove them severely. Tell them to stop. Reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. Now notice the goal is not to get rid of people who have wrong teaching. It is to change them. So that they may be sound and healthy. You're not just saying stop. You're urging to believe what is right. So look at the last characteristic of the doctrinal life of an elder that we need to look at. Confrontation, yes, it's inevitable. It's necessary, but let's look at another, finally. An elder is doctrinally gospel-centered in his demonstration. Demonstration. Verses 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. What do I mean by demonstration here? What I mean by this is that his life and his teaching draw a clear line between what is of the gospel and what is not of the gospel. This phrase, to the pure, all things are pure, this is likely referring to people who are trying to urge Christians to avoid eating and drinking certain foods because they will make you spiritually unhealthy or healthy. And why do I think that? Because it's connected to the Jewish myths and genealogies. It's very similar to what you find in 1 Timothy chapter 4, a false teaching that's connected to this kind of idea. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons, which every false doctrine, by the way, has its genesis in the demonic. By means of hypocrisy of liars seared in their own consciousness with a branding iron. And what are they doing? What are they teaching? Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. So there's some who would say if you want to be spiritually healthy you can't take this, you have to do that, you have to eat this, you got to avoid that. 
No, to the pure, to those who have been purified by the gospel and see everything by God, all things are pure. This would be another one of those moments where the Judaizers are saying, hey, you can't, Kansas City is a bad place to live because you can't eat barbecue. Ribs are off. No, he said, no, to the pure, ribs are godly. Right? That's the application. Pulled pork is of the Lord. (laughs) False teachers are always forbidding what God actually creates to be enjoyed. They're always pressing another agenda. But on the flip side of that, notice verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. They say, if you follow our rules, you'll know God, and yet... Those same people are the ones who struggle most with what it means to know God. And their deeds and their lifestyle, the way they live, is not governed by righteousness. And they overturn any true knowledge of God by their own lifestyle. They claim a religion that doesn't fit their behavior. You need an elder who's going to be doctrinally faithful, don't you? To watch over the flock. It's his calling, his family life, his personal life, his doctrinal life that actually exposes false teachers and brings health to the church. The elder lives a life, he preaches a message that makes his own gospel-centered life clear And it begins to translate then into the gospel-centered behavior of the members, which is where we go next in chapter 2. So friends, can I just say this in closing? When you're looking for a church, I want you to hear me on this carefully. Because I find this, there's a lot of godly elders and pastors out there who don't have the most charismatic presentation on the platform. They're not the most gifted of all the teachers out there. They're not the ones that you can, you can sit and you, you, you think, ah, oh, I just sit all day and listen to that. You think, oh, he's a little raw in his presentation skills. It's what people say about, you know, well, the music's authentic. It's not excellent. I need a place where the, the presentation is skillful and perfect and, and, and it, it could be on TV. Friends, don't look for that. Don't be moved by presentation on a stage. Everything in here is about what kind of life do the leaders of that church live Yes. Do you notice he said nothing about music? He said nothing about organizational skill. He didn't say anything about fundraising ability. He didn't say anything about organizational habits. He didn't say anything about those things here. Some of that might be helpful. But listen, when you get a man who is centered on the gospel and he drive, it drives everything in his life and he has gifts and abilities to teach, those other things can be learned But you need a man who is constantly dripping with faithfulness to Christ. You need eldership that is driving you to that. That creates spiritual health, doesn't it? Let's pray together. Father, this is always convicting for me to talk about knowing all of my own sinful habits and my own My own sinful thoughts reminds me again of how much I need the Savior. That if left to myself, I would be all of these things that are spoken of in terms of false teachers. And so I'm personally grateful for what you have rescued me from because of Christ. And I pray that not only for myself, but the other elders of this church, that you will help us to be sensitive to your word, daily washing our hearts and minds in the scripture, honestly dealing with our sins before you, 
open to the rebuke and the testimony of others coming alongside of us to encourage us to greater faithfulness. I pray you would keep our elders here from sinfulness and pride and arrogance and give all of us together a heart to serve the flock according to your word. I also pray, Lord, that you will raise up others in this church who will be such faithful elders, who will love the flock because they love you first. They'll give themselves to the flock because they've given themselves to the work of the gospel. I pray the congregation will see them, recognize them, and affirm them. More than all of that, Lord, I pray that the exemplary lives of the elders will simply encourage our members to live gospel-centered lives. And we would see not a higher standard for leaders, but the same standard that we're called to, simply fleshed out. I pray for those in the room who are not followers of Christ, and perhaps they have in their heart, they have seen leaders who are errant and arrogant and self-willed, and they've used it as something to turn away from Christ, I pray that you would remind them that the accountability that they have is not to some fallen leader. The accountability, the accountability they have is before you. And yet you've paid the price so that their sins can be forgiven too. Draw their heart to yourself. Lord, thank you for this church who loves your truth and loves the leaders of this church and shows such kindness and regard towards those who lead. Lord, we thank you for such grace and pray that you would keep us in the gospel so that your name is clearly seen. We pray in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ.